whole shit be going. That's how efficient they were back wow. back then. And um, <clears throat> we would, I, I, it would, when they showed the movie in the theater, we would come out on the on the, on the stage after the movie, and the whole wow, the whole place we showed a low kick, yeah, the whole the whole movie theater just went bananas. So we was like the, the talk of Tokyo, and we introduced hip hop to Japan. Wow. Personally, just from that movie and that tour. Wow. We went to clubs. DJ still had the big thick rubber mat on the motherfucking turntable. Wow. And we would get on the turntable and be like, yo, could we, could, you know. Because you can't cut take, with the rubber mat. Hell no, you take the Yeah, you gotta take it, you gotta take it, you gotta take it. You gotta take it, you gotta take it. Yeah. Boom. These niggas looking in amazement, like, what the fuck is y'all doing? <laughs> but by the time we left Japan, oh, it was on it. when we revisited those right. clubs, they was doing that. Right. Hello! Little kids was breakdancing in the street because they saw crazy legs and they would right. do an exhibition. In- so, good evening. As I promised, this is Bedtime Stories. But tonight, I'm not going to be talked. I'm going to be doing the review for um, Take All of Me this evening. I am going to be talking to you all in memoriam of 9-11. So I'm going to mix me a little drink here. I got me my Captain Morgan pineapple and my Sailor Jerry Spice Rum. As you can see, there's only a little bit in each bottle, so, you know, either we're going to talk about 2001 and 9-11 until I'm done, or I pass out, because that Sailor Jerry's is 92 proof. Now, the Captain Moore, the fruity rum is... Only 70 proof, so that isn't going to put me to sleep right away. That's, that's going to give me a little rock and pop, baby. I might be a little tiny eyes. My eyes will be made small. So let's get into it. Um, 2001 January. We had survived tw- to the year 2000. You got to remember it back in the year 2000. Or oh, I'm saying back in 1999. It was this thing called Y2K. And for us back then, we just knew that the world was going to come to an end. People were partying like it's 1999. They knew as soon as the s- clock struck, 12 in the year 2000 all the computers are going to shut down you won't be able to get your electricity you won't be able to watch tv can't get cable channels you can't get nothing okay we was prepared for the worst so we made it through 2000 nothing shut down and there was no major uh Extinction world event and those who know who who are my age they know about Buster Rhymes um extinction world event you know they were expecting more like what's happening today to have happened back then. Um and it's really it wasn't that bad. So no apocalypse, no zombie apocalypse, no anarchy. Bush George W. Baby Bush, I call him Baby Bush because he's the son, um, had just (laughs) questionably won the election. And um, Gore had conceded so that Bush can go ahead and go through his inaugural. So a lot of us were made our eyes small at George Bush and his administration. And um, 
I was currently in a relationship with a nigga. Okay? With a nigga. I said it. At that time, I was poorly renting. When I say poorly renting, because I was following... This was the first living boyfriend. And anything... This was serious to me. So I was dating him. We weren't paying the rent. And I have to put in this nugget is that I was renting a townhouse in Southeast D.C. on Alabama Avenue from my parents. Okay? So... Per this person's, I'm not going to say that word too much. I don't really like using the word on camera or in front of uh, the mass majority. You know, I'm from, from it's inward everything, okay? This Negro, I was following this man unwisely, and he suggested we don't pay the rent. So that we can pay other things and get other things done. Okay. And I unwisely followed this young man. I am 20. I just turned, on January 5th, I turned 29 years old. And um, after a series of months of not paying our rent to my parents... We walked away from the townhouse. We didn't even try to make it right. My son was three um, at this point, at the beginning of the year. And he, um, you know, so it was me, him, and the guy that I was dating at the time. We moved in with his best friend and my co-worker into a dusty basement. Now, this does not say, it's not, I'm not talking bad about the people who took us in, who we moved in with, but if they happen to watch this or someone shares it with them, that basement was dusty. And I'm following this dusty dude into a dusty basement. Okay? Um... And really, it's significant because I chose him over my parents, over my family, over my relationship, and unfortunately over my son at times because I later found out some things happened. You know, I trusted him with my son and he chose, he found to be untrustworthy with my son. Um... I was, but it's like all in the name of love. Um, we were going to be a family. I mean, because it, mind you, this guy was dusty from the beginning of our relationship. Real talk. Okay. Not a bad guy, but he was dusty. And when I say dusty, I'm not talking about physically dusty. Like, he was very well kept, you know, shower, clean cut. He spent more time in the bathroom than I did. And as a woman, inside I, I felt this type of way about it. So, um, and I was blinded by the possibility of actually forming a long-term relationship with some, this is the guy, I, he moved into my place, you know, so, but it didn't end well. We moved into his friend's how, uh, house, um, and two weeks later, nigga broke up with me. And I acted a whole ass. <laughs> you think I didn't when I did? Um, I just chose you, your dusty ass. Oh, my, what my parents, the relationship, because that townhouse was more than just a place for us to stay. My place, this was the relationship between my parents and I. 
it was already strained because I had a child outside of marriage. And my parents were very churchy and old school. That I was a heathenous bitch, okay? That caused a lot of arguments in that household between my mother and my father. My mother and my dad. My father is biological and still here and was not there. So, I was hot. You mean, nigga. I chose you because I thought you had a plan. And you wonder why I am flipping the whole fuck out in these streets? You talking about you need a break? You need a break, nigga? You could have broke when I still had the townhouse. And I could possibly have tucked my tail in and eat the humble pie and beg for my parents' forgiveness for following your dusty behind. But you wait until you move us out of my parents' house, me? You don't understand. My parents literally kicked out tenants. They were great tenants, by the way. They were not good tenants at all. But they went through hell to get them out to put me in there only for you to... So he was like, he literally was shocked. That I was acting a whole fucking ass. You got us living in a dusty ass basement. In your friend's house. Talking about you going to go down to um, Georgia. And scout, scout out a place for sustaining this sin for us. And your ass ain't doing shit. You ain't even got a fucking job. I actually left my other job. Thinking I could rely on him. But I don't blame him. I blame me. Because the signs were there that he was a dusty motherfucker. Okay. Back then. No, not, not one family member liked his ass. Friends didn't like him. I stopped going to church. People just didn't like the whole. I changed. My mom told me, girl, you, you changed since you got with him. And I, I, I did. I changed. So, what was the worst thing emotionally that ever happened in my life happened in January 15th? I remember because it was Martin Luther King's birthday. Not the holiday. It was literally January 15th, 2001. We were sitting out in the car in front of his homeboy's house where we were staying. And he said, like, oh, yeah, um, I'm going to need to take a break. I lost my whole head. I lost my shit. What the fuck you talking about? He started staying out late, not coming back home. He wasn't working. And he wasn't paying his friend anything. And I was bringing in very little money working with my co-worker as a contractor for Comcast. Auditing, I was getting up, driving from in the surrounding cities of D.C. and Maryland. Um, as you can tell that Maryland, really, Maryland. <laughs> Going up a ladder to the cable line and checking the cable line. Auditing who was had cable, who didn't. Who was still in cable, who didn't. Okay? Getting paid contract work per line I checked and shit like that. Okay? Traveling to Philadelphia, doing the same thing there. And going down to Florida, doing that stuff like that there. Okay? And I had a good time doing it, but it wasn't paying the bills. And then your ass want to talk about, you want a break? Seriously? So, 
eventually it came to blows. Not on that day. After him staying out late, I started feeling a type of way. So I, because I have got all this stuff to kind of keep our stuff off the dusty floor. Got a hand. I'm like, fuck your shit. You know, whatever. I was throwing this stuff and said, you lucky I ain't throwing. He came back and he saw his shit on the ground. You know, on you know on the floor. I'm like, whatever. And so he put his hands on me. Like he didn't hit me, punch me, he just grabbed me up and then pushes it. Next time you, you know, whatever, threaten me. I'm like, fuck you, you lucky I ain't putting that shit outside. I'm, and I'm fighting the desire to throw his shit outside. You know, fuck you. You want to break up with me and you think I'm going to still take care of you? Fuck you. Okay. Fuck you. You dusty best bastard. So, um, so I, when he released me, I went upstairs, I ran up the stairs and which led to the kitchen and there was a cast iron skillet and he was running behind me and there was knives and forks, right? So my thought, cause I'm still, I'm just not a killer. Okay, I, I, I still have a huge filter, so I chose to grab the spoons, forks, and knives, not sharp knives, butter knives, and I threw it, and then he got upstairs, and he kicked me, like, he pushed me to the ground, and I'm like, this on the ground, like, I'm sitting up assessing, how can I get up, sweep his feet, and get the advantage, because... When you push, you push me. I'm on the ground, bitch. Okay. I'm, well, not on the hard ground, outside ground, but on the floor in the kitchen. And I'm thinking, okay, there's a way. I'm going to have to sweep this motherfucker off his feet some way, form or fashion. And get that. Because now my filter is going down. Now I'm right. I, I'm thinking I'm going to have to kill this motherfucker. Not that I could because he was, he also knew martial arts. So, he ain't, you know what I'm saying? But I have been in abusive situations before. And I refuse to just sit there and take that shit. Not this time. A car is going to fight back. So, I'm looking about how I can get the advantage. Okay? And right at that moment, his friend, my co-worker... Came in the kitchen, like, what's going on? He stood up between me and him. You know, I'm on the floor. And whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I think his wife called the police. And reported a domestic violence situation. Between me and him. And, um. Police came. Talked to both of us. And basically he said, okay. Okay, I'm going to either, he's going to have, one of y'all going to have to agree to leave and, or I'm going to have to take both of y'all in for this. And though he was a dusty nigga, okay, he was still a gentleman and so he chose to leave. Okay, um, so that I didn't have to go in. Or, no, 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 I'm sorry. Correction, I believe his friend, my co-worker, and I consider him still my friend, said it was up to him either you're going to have to make one of them leave or I'm going to have to take both of them in. And he chose me. So he left, came back for his stuff when I wasn't there, I guess. And, um... You know, so I stayed there for maybe like a week or so. I went back to church. I reconnected to uh, my son's best friend's mom, who was a, also a very good friend of mine at the time. You know, and the, my son's three at this time. So best friend, this is a friend he's known since childhood. Like since he was born, like me and her was in the same 
we went to a church conference and we were um, given the same room. And since then, me and her connected, thus they connected. And they were literally four days apart. And me and her were four days apart. It was crazy, you know. And um, so we reconnected. And she said, hey, you can stay with me, you know, so on and so forth. Um, I'll let you have the bed, whatever. So I ended up staying with her for about nine months, almost a year, but nine months. It was good for all of two weeks before it became hell. So I'm now not working at the contractor for Comcast. I'm now looking for, I'm doing little temp jobs here and there. Okay, so I'm, yeah, I'm doing temp jobs. Sometimes I'm working, sometimes I'm not. But, you know, it started out well. Like I said, it started out well. I would say maybe for, I say about two weeks to a month, it was good. Now, hmm. I don't know how I want to say this. If I want to say that. I'm going to say all 50. She's a Capricorn just like me. And one thing I've learned about us is we are good in the beginning. Like we'll say, come, you can stay with us um, we'll, until you get up on your feet, which is absolutely the wrong thing to say. Because unless you're ready for them to be with you for a while, because what a person thinks, stay, I'll be being up on their feet, is not the same as what you would think. You know, it doesn't take, it's not a six month gig thing. You know what I'm saying? You, you know what I'm saying? I haven't even secured a steady job yet. You know what I'm saying? I'm temping, I'm going, I'm applying for jobs, but they don't always, you know, I'm not just this pretty, pretty girl and I can, they just giving me well paying jobs. I don't have the pretty privilege. Not that I'm saying that I'm ugly, but I've never been that dainty, pretty, you know. I am all the things that society don't think is, can qualify for the pretty privilege. Okay, I'm dark skinned, I wear glasses, I got nappy hair, you know what I'm saying. I'm not exotically dark, you know what I'm saying. I'm not exotic, so I can't do modeling. I'm not a whore on the street, you know, I, I'm not a big makeup wearer, and I'm not trying to be as white as possible. I like being black, I always have been, you know, so it took me longer than she expected, but it was all good. We were, we shopped, we grocery shopped together. I think for some reason I was either getting food stamps or something where we could, we, I was able to reasonably share in the grocery. So we went shopping the first week I moved in there. We'll just go shopping together and split the grocery bill. And then um, the issue came where the, her children who were old, her older daughters were saying that I was eating up all the food that I paid half for. Not only that, sister had an issue with a utility bill so that we can have this full utility bill. I put the utility bill in my name and paid that bill. Okay. <laughs> you know, so... I started out where her, my son was sleeping in with her son. They're, they're good friends, so that was great. Um, um, I, I, I skipped over the fact that this breakup really took me down. Before I moved in, like when I say it took me out, that relationship took me out. This is 2001. About this is January, February, the beginning of February, and when it, it broke up, and like when I say I was, I I was brokenhearted. I was mad. I 
I was at my lowest I've ever been in my life. My lowest emotionally and mentally. I was so, I was broken. When I say he broke me, that relationship broke me. That relationship broke me. And I've had been, uh, I had been raped before. And not in the like, beat me up, snatch me into an alley type of rape. But what happened was rape. Um, had to go, you know, I've been through some shit. I've been abused in a relationship. But that relationship broke me. When I say broke me, like. I had enough to be able to get up and go to work. That little contract job and deal with that. Um, but, and, and take my son to school. I had mustered up the energy to be able to take my son to school. My car was repossessed during that period. All in that time period. Right there in that January, February, my car was repossessed. I had just enough energy to take my son to school. I didn't, I was depressed, oppressed. I, you know, I really beat myself up over that situation because I got myself involved with it. I, like, he had his thing, but I am a big proponent of taking responsibility of what I did. And I ignored all of the red signs. And they were neon red signs. I mean, like, I had enough to go take my son to school, pick him up from school, just enough. You know. Put him to bed, give him a bath, put him to bed. And I remember one night that I was so despondent, didn't know what. I was really out of it that I roamed around Southeast back to the townhouse and all I did was stand across the street like, what have I done? I had a whole townhouse in a decent part of Southeast DC. I mean, it was, it was bad. It was bad. It was bad and I'm only kind of really being able to talk to or say talk about it live it was bad like that relationship broke the fuck out of me but moving on so eventually a few days of being having a pity party basically and being in the dumps I had to pull myself together for my son's sake I had to pull it together. Another thing us black women do, especially dark skinned chicks like me, I had to pull it together. I had to fucking pull it together. I didn't have the, 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 the uh, ability or I didn't have the uh, privilege of having a pity party. I had a child to take care of. You know? And I wasn't going to be given nothing. Nobody's going to pay my bills. And eventually this nigga is not going to want me to be here. After choosing me over his best friend. Okay? So that came to an end and that's I went back to church, reconnected with my friend. She helped me out. I stayed with her. It was good at first. Then there was an issue with her children saying that I was eating all the food. So then me and my son, was I just was buying food just for him. And I was eating whenever I was at my temp assignments or grabbing something at 7-Eleven. Basically, that's what it came down to. I was buying pork and beans and hot dogs just for Nathan 
so that he can have something to eat. This is what you're eating. We're not going to buy no food with these people. You saying, no, I'm eating the food. Well, this is our food. This right here, this, my, our food was about this much. It was hot dogs, pork and beans. Okay. And if we were blessed, which we were, there's other friends that I had that, you know, we go over there and we have dinner and stuff like that. I don't have a car. So we're staying there. And so we had that issue. Then it's a, only a three bedroom house. She has three children. She stays in her, the, the master room of this house that she's renting. And her oldest daughter had a room. And her young, her middle girl and her son, I think, shared that room. But her son usually, she he was still three, three, four years old. So he kind of still slept with his mom. So, um, and the same with my son. So, unfortunately, I really feel bad about it. Even to this day, I kind of end up taking over poor, uh, her, her oldest daughter's um, room. I did. I took it over. Unfortunately, I, I was sleeping on the floor, but eventually I was sleeping on the bed. And then, you know, her daughter was sleeping, you know. I mean, it was just bad. And it was a one bed. I mean, it was three bedrooms with one bathroom with four women. Well, four females living in there. I, they were always in there. You had a teenage daughter or middle school. Teenage or middle school. I'm, I'm not sure which one. You know, she was in high school. First year or so. In Suitland, Maryland. My son was still going to Ann Beers. At first, when we first did it, moved in there. The friend, because she was driving to where she had a van, she was going that way. She would drop Nathan off at school and pick him up because she'd get there before I did. Okay? In true Capricorn style, as soon as he cramped her style, she was like, I can't pick up Nathan no more. Okay. Now, I'm not going to say it happened like in a month's time, but I know it, it didn't take long before it was like, I can't pick him up no more. She still had to go that way to go to school. I mean, go to work. And to get home. I'm on the fucking metro. I don't have a car. I can't get here in time to pick him up without incurring late fees, which I don't have a fucking job to do. I mean, like a, a full-time job. I am temping here and there and going on interviews. How am I... Okay. And at the time, there was not a bus. That I could take, that I could afford. Like, I can go, I can go to interviews in D.C. So, there wasn't a bus that took me close enough that I knew at the time. That didn't even take me down the street to get me close to the house, um, to her house. So, whenever I was on an assignment, I dropped my son off. We had to get dressed, get up early, walk down Pennsylvania Avenue, which is like in Atlanta, it's like walking down, not even Memorial ain't, doesn't qualify. It is a major, major highway type of street. So we had to walk down that street. I'd take him to school. Okay, and we didn't have Uber and Lyft. And taxis were too much for me at this point. And then I'd pick him up from school when I, I'd get off on the bus, pick him up from school, and then walk right across, right, I mean, continue, and, and me and him would walk Pennsylvania Avenue till we get to her house. And she felt no ways about it. I, I felt a whole lot of ways about that. It's like, God damn it. Damn it. Okay. 
this is how I should have known when I moved here. My dad would have done the same thing. My father would have done the same thing. He was all about picking Nathan up and, and giving me time to get from Midtown to Marietta in traffic. As soon as it started cramping his style, I can't pick Nathan up. I can't drop him off. I'm home. It, that's just how we are. We'll start off, we'll, we'll be the sun and the moon and the sky for you. And I felt that, I felt, it took, like, like I said in my promotional videos earlier, it took every, it took all, every ounce of God in me not to talk bad about this woman to other people. Because she was my, she was a sister in the church. And she was doing a favor by letting me stay with her. You know, because she was. She was still doing me a favor. But it was pure hell. I stayed with her nine months. It was pure hell for six of those months. And then it got to the point, like, at the end of the summer. This is about August. Our sons have turned four. Okay, and she's like, she leaves a note on the bed that I commandeered, I took from her daughter. Sorry, babe, if you're watching this. Sorry. You know, I, I just have a takeover spirit, but, you know, I hated doing that, but I end up doing it, sorry. But, um... With a note. So now this was going in to 9-11. So at this point, I am working at the National Institute of Health, NIH, in Bethesda, Maryland. I uh, have to travel at to the end of the red line in Maryland and then take a shuttle to my workplace. I was an assistant to the director of the of NIH. One of the directors. In 2001, now, I remember, I don't know if I heard it on the shuttle bus radio, because, you know, the bus driver would um, have a radio, but... Just, it, just August 25th, Aaliyah had just passed away. Okay. From the, the accident, the airplane accident. 2001 was a horrible year for airplanes. So this, on September 11th, I got up early, dropped my son off at school. I go get on the tr long train ride out to... Um, Bethesda to the last um, stop. Um, I think it was Rockville stop. And then took the shuttle. I'm there. The director is out of the country on business. Okay. And so I'm sitting there. I'm typing up stuff. I'm, 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 being, I'm doing busy work. And I see one of the uh, associates or one of the, the ladies that worked with him, like, I got to call my father to see if he was in the building. And she's just, she's not, ah, but she's like, I'm like, I'm looking at her like, what? what's going on? I'm oblivious. Okay, mind you, back then we didn't have YouTube and um, Instagram or any type of social media to tell us anything. Okay. And it's like, and I'm getting calls, like, from higher-ups, like, I need to speak to so-and-so-and-so. -and -so -and -so. Uh, he's not, let me see if I can get this person. It is important. I need to talk to this, another person. If he's not there, I need to speak to so-and-so-and-so. -and -so. I'm like, oh, oh, man, what's the big deal? Okay, let me get somebody for you. Okay. So, I talk to, I get someone else. And they're saying, 
we're gonna have to leave immediately. We're, we're leaving, there's been a major situation. Uh, planes have flew into the, um, to, into the uh, um, uh, uh, World Trade Center. I'm like, what? So now I understood why she was kind of like talking like, I got to get in touch with my father in New York. And yeah, da, da, da. and I'm like, oh, okay. And so the IT guy was able to pull a stream of the towers and the plane going into it. And I'm in his office with other people. It's like, oh my God. Are you serious? So we, this is morning. This is the morning time. I didn't even have my coffee yet. I don't think I was drinking coffee like that at that time. But I didn't even get that good yet before it's like, we're shutting down. Everybody go home. Okay? And, and it's like, oh my God. And then, and I'm telling you, it's only by the grace of God. I promise you I must have taken that last train in D.C. because you know also a plane went flew into the Pentagon. Because if they're doing the Trade Center, D.C. is next. So I'm not hysterical. I'm just kind of like, wow, this, this is really real. This is going on. What? And then it's like, oh, they didn't hit the Pentagon and blah, blah, blah. Once they hit the Pentagon, they started shutting down the metro train system. And so, I, again, like I must have taken that last train in. And got on that bus to get my son from Ann Beers Elementary School. All I can think, my I wasn't hysterical. All I'm thinking is... I need to get to my son. That's it. That's my only concern was getting to my son. I got to get my son. Because if they're doing that and then they hit in the Pentagon, I don't know what else is going to ensue. You know, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, are they going to start dropping bombs on the, in the D.C. metropolitan area? Because my son is going to school in D.C. But now he's not by the White House or nothing. But still, you know, all I want is my son. So I got, by the grace of God, I promise you, because right after I got off, I, I off the train and got on the bus, I heard they shut down the train system. Because they, you know, and a lot of people had to walk home. If they wanted to get out of D.C., they, you know, they had to walk home. Now, mind you, I am way away from D.C. I'm all the way in Bethesda, Maryland. Okay, way out there. Okay, I'm in, I'm not in the sticks, but I'm out there. And I don't have a car. Okay, so... Only by the grace of God, I got on that. I got on that shuttle that got me to the train station. And I promise you, it was the last train in. After that, they started shutting down train systems. I did not have to walk home. I got to. Uh, I'm trying to think. I got to Anacostia Station, which took me to um, over by my son's school. I got my son. I you know. They was definitely releasing kids. Got my son. We took that walk across Pennsylvania Avenue and we got home and we watched the news. And we saw the buildings come down. And we saw where the plane had hit the Pentagon. It was mass hysteria. People were walking home from... Uh, from downtown D.C. because the trains weren't working. Because in that city, in a major city like D.C. and New York, a lot of people, they, they commute into the city, but they don't drive in. They take the train in. 
So in order to get home, huh, they wanted to get because there was no nobody was picking up in DC. No taxis were picking up. We did again. We didn't have Uber and Lyft back then. We didn't have ride share. You either took the train and the bus or you took a taxi if you had money like that. And you occasionally drove in if you had big money like that. You know what I'm saying? And it was just mass hysteria. It was mass hysteria. And I made it back home just in time. And I really, I feel like I got home maybe a couple of hours than what I would have. Because, mind you, it took me a good hour or so, a couple of hours to get to work. Well, no, maybe an hour because they're more, <laughs> I, it took me a long time, okay? So it took me a long time to get in and get back to Suitland. And we watched them, and I was like, I couldn't believe what was happening. You know, I couldn't believe it. Did this really happened in America? This is America. This is happening in the United States of America. And so they can found out that they really, they um. Middle Eastern people, because I'm not sure if it was necessarily Iraq or Iran and where they actually was coming from, but it was just crazy, even in D.C. And I was just happy to have gotten to my son and got back to the place. Um, thank God. Um, my friend, even, she, she worked on a base, but... You know, they sent them home early. Kids got home early. And we was just all sitting and watching the news like, what is really good? Um, thank God none of my friends or family that I knew were in the towers by the grace of God. And none of my friends or family was at the Pentagon or on that side of the Pentagon. When the plane hit, hit it. Um, some testimonies for it. I did, the friend that I stayed with at the beginning of January, well, he had a contract job working at the Pentagon. Or something where he had to deliver to the Pentagon. Or he had to go to the Pentagon to do stuff. And um, I'm calling him like, he said, no. Nah. I, I called him like, you okay? Is everything all right? He was like, <laughs> was just as interesting that I literally didn't did not have to go to the Pentagon today. Normally I would go, but I did not go. Um a church member of mine worked at the Pentagon back then and literally she said maybe a couple of weeks prior to the that whole situation in September eleventh they had moved her office from where the p p the plane hit the Pentagon to the other side of the Pentagon. And she was there. But she wasn't where the plane hit. She was able to get out and safe and her office not affected. Um, so I thankfully... And at that time, my father, my dad, did not work over there. And I believe he was able to work from home or drive, but he didn't get involved. He worked for FCC. So they weren't near that, but he was able to get, there was no issues with him. Because I think maybe he was working from home at this point. No, no, this is 2001. No, so he would have been at work. Um, I don't recall anything happening with any of my family members. Um, I think in 2001, my, my brother was going to school still in Clemson in South Carolina. And my mom and my 
other siblings in 2001, 2001, 2001. Yeah. My siblings, my younger siblings were in high school, so they were not near anything that would have. But I'm pretty sure they got to go home early. So, I mean, that was crazy. And so, mind you, I had also, after that, I had an interview with a law firm that was in D.C. And I went to that interview when I went to that interview, this is shortly after 9-11, the events of 9-11, and there was Hummers on every corner. In military vehicles on every corner. It felt, I felt that that's the closest I ever got to a war zone. I found out later and I don't know why it didn't click to me because I guess the way I came in on the train, it clicked to me. My office that I later end up tipping at, tipping to perm and getting the job was around the corner from the White House. No wonder there was Hummers on every corner going to the office. You know what I'm saying? Oh my, I can't remember the, the train station, but I could take either the green line or I could take the um, red line to get me to my office. Both of them were close to my, I could take either one of the trains to get to work. I ended up eventually getting it and those hummers were there for the remainder of the year. Duh, this has happened in September. I eventually, by the end of the month, because this is right after 9-11, uh, shortly after that, I got a note from the friend that I was staying with, hey, basically saying, I promised myself I'd never take care of another person again after so-and-so-and-so she took care of the white girl. She was fine taking care of the white girl forever, but for me, nine months was enough. Okay, no, I'm just joking. It's not, it had nothing to do with white or black. I think it's just me. Pretty privilege. I don't have it. Doesn't rock with me. I don't get pretty privilege. Um, she gave me a note. Look, you got a month to get out. Find you a place. I'm stressed. Like, Lord, I need a place to stay. And I remember breaking down... After dropping my son off and trying to catch it up, I don't know why I was over there, to be honest with you. I'm going to be real honest with you. I don't know if I was taking a bus or something, but I happened to be walking past, try, I guess trying to, because I dropped my son off. That's why. Because I think this was, school was out for some reason. Maybe it was the holiday. There was some reason I was taking him to the babysitter and I was walking to catch the bus and I'm stressed like, Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm trying to find a place. I don't know whatever. Da -da -da -da, right. I look to my right and there's an apartment complex. Right there, um, uh, 28th place. So I'll go over there and apply for an apartment. Mind you, I'm tempting. Apply for a, a two bedroom apartment. And I was given favor, okay? To stay, I mean, to get that apartment because I my job wasn't permanent yet. I said, but I can give you, sell you that I'm making this much, and they have intentions on, um, whatever uh, on hiring me permanent. So she accepted that letter, and I got the apartment. This helped me was so happy. 
that I had found me an apartment as soon as I found, signed the lease, bitch, dropped me off at night with no furniture. Okay, me and my son is sleeping on the floor. We ain't got shit. I said, you can come pick up the rest of your stuff later. She dropped me off at those apartments. Bye. She kept my, she kept, she kept that mattress I gave her though. And she, I really think she really thought I was going to, and once I, you know, I had got the job, once I got the job, whatever, I'm like, okay, well, in order for me to have electric and gas, because I had electric, I had a gas stove and electric, you know, heat and whatever. Guess what? I'm not going to sit up there and have my name in for your gas and in my name, okay? I might have been born at night, but I wasn't born last night, bitch. I'm taking my ga the gas out of my name. That has, you know, the gas that has been that warmed your ass in the winter time. Yes, bitch. I said, I'm just calling you to let you know I'm taking the gas out of your name, my name over there, because I need this for my gas here. And I sensed that she actually had an attitude. Like, really, bitch? Yes, that means you're going to have to actually get your crap, your shit together. You had nine months to get your shit together. Just like you kicking me out. Oh, you thought. You thought I was going to keep it in my name, bitch. You might be older than me by 10 years, but you ain't that much older. I'm not stupid. You're not going to keep the gas in my name so you can fuck up my credit. There's a reason why you can't get a gas bill uh, now. Bitch, please. I changed that shit to my name. And well, thank you. Please provide that gas. Take that out of my name. I need this in mind. Really felt like she had an attitude. I really sense it. I she did. She probably did. She had the attitude I felt she had. Hello. I'm sorry. I feel like I had a gnat on my leg. Bitch, really thought I was gonna let her keep it in my her name. I mean my name. Well, bitch, you kicked me out. You said I had to go. And some reason, how you think? Now mind you. This is in my name. I'm using my good name so that your place can stay heated and you can um, cook and you can have hot water. But how easily you forget that shit when you feel like you're being used. And I'm telling you as a Capricorn, if we feel like we're being used and oftentimes we give so much in the beginning and we promise you the world in the beginning. And as soon as it cramps our style, we don't want to do it no more. So we stop because we feel like it's not being reciprocated and we're not doing it. But with us, it doesn't matter what you do. If we just done with doing it and it cramps our style, then it doesn't matter what you do. We're done doing it. I, I, I'm guilty. I did the same thing kind of with my mom. I'm glad that I only did it, took care of her for three months in summer. Because eventually I was going to be like, bitch, I already did everything. It's time for me to go. You know, because I'm only good in the short periods. You know what I'm saying? And because I know this about myself, I try not to offer you the world. Like, you can stay here tonight. You can stay here for a couple of months. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? To, you know... But, yeah, I, that's just how we are. And so, one of the things that they did at 9-11 is they, what I didn't quite like is in schools, they was telling kids about this and that people died and stuff like that. And it's like, ma'am, why are you telling my son? He is five. Yeah, he's four years old. How are you telling him about Ma'am, how you telling him about, you know what I'm saying, this tragedy? And telling him about death. I didn't like it at the time, but that was the one time in my lifetime 
where I felt like if you was American, it didn't matter if you were white, black, American, born in America. Everybody kind of had each other's back. It's like, oh, you, I'm cool. Let the black lady in. Let the black guys in. Oh, oh if you have any, a hajib, I can't, I can't remember. And I don't want to disrespect someone. But they, were, they looked like they was from the Middle East. They had the head wrap on. And you might not be, you might be from India. But you look like you from the other, I mean, from, from Middle East, the racism wasn't on black people so much anymore. You know what I'm saying? They would sooner let a black person in before they would let someone who looked like they were from the Middle East. Okay, and it was crazy. It was a crazy time. But, I mean, I wish I had more like, oh, my uncle was in... The Pentagon, when it hit, I was mad. I don't have those stories because I, if you can't tell, am blessed. Okay, I don't, I don't, I might not be driving a McLaren, which I saw at the gas station on Friday. Like, I seen a McLaren. Oh, what the rappers be talking about? <laughs> in my head, I didn't act that way, but in my head, like, oh, McLaren. And that's what it looked like. Okay, but it was a McLaren. Um... But I don't have all that tragic story because I'm blessed. I mean, like, again, I'm not driving Mercedes and shit, but just like I got in right in time to be able to get to my son. I got the job. A couple of weeks later, it was a couple of weeks, they offered me a job after a couple of weeks of work and found a place. And the furniture that I left in the townhouse, guess who kept it in their basement? My parents. You know what I'm saying? So I, they end up giving me back all that furniture. So my son had a bed. Uh, a friend of mine's, actually a friend that I met through being in a relationship with this dusty Negro. End up giving me a bed or being a source of a bed for my son. So he got a bed. I bought some cheap mattresses from the local little, um, I can't even think of what it like, little outlet, little marketplace. And I end up getting a car. Um, the next year, I end up buying a car full out for my cousin, you know. So, and getting a job and then getting a bonus I ain't never had. Yo, it was, it, it after that was tremendously blessed. Okay, I know I'm not pretty, I might not have pretty privilege, but when you look at me, I'm a blessed individual. And, I mean, again, I might not be driving the Mercedes and McLarens and staying in mansions. I always tend to stay in the best place in the area in which I stay. If I stay in the hood, I'm staying in the best apartment, the brand new apartment complex. Because I was in the hood when I got that apartment in Southeast. But guess what, boo? They had just renovated it. I mean, when I say they just renovated the whole complex, that's, you know, it was only two buildings. They had just renovated them. Boom. I mean, yes, I live behind a halfway house, but them niggas never mess with me. Matter of fact, they was really nice, actually. You know what I'm saying? Um, I got my car stolen, but I that car wasn't for me. Then I bought the car that was for me, which was from my cousin, who bought cars and built, I mean, you know, fixed them up and resold them. I was very blessed. I always live, I always get the best. You know what I'm saying? I always, God always takes care of me. I don't need pretty privilege because God always takes care of me. 
always takes care of me and my child, okay? We always get the best until that, and right when I started seeing mice in that apartment, guess who I started talking to? My father that was here in Atlanta. And he was, you know, basically, he lured me down to Georgia. It wasn't hard, though. He lured me down to Georgia in hopes of, of, of owning the house that he lives in, only for it not to happen that way. But I got out of Southeast right when it started to get a little bad in that apartment complex and moved to East Piedmont, which is a really nice town out of town. You think the rich people live in Buckhead, bitch? No. They don't live in Buckhead, bitch. Okay, they live in East Marietta. They live in Dunwich Hay. Okay, they live in Stone Mountain, the other stone side of Stone Mountain, not the Niggerville Stone Mountain. We talking about the other side where they have lake houses. Okay? That's where rich people live. Duluth. That's where the real rich people live. Duluth. East Piedmont, Cherokee County, okay, the Stone Mountain, the real Stone Mountain, the where, again, where they have lake houses, not Niggerville, okay, Decatur, Midtown, that's where the real rich people live here in Atlanta, metropolitan area, okay, so, that was my story, my bedtime story, for to this evening. Next week, we will resume with chapter 9 and 10 of Take All of Me at volume 2. You all have a wonderful evening. And take a moment of silence to remember those we lost 20 years ago in 9-11. Remember, love yourself, love your neighbor, and stay authentic. All right? Bye!